everybody and welcome back to the P1 Podcast with Matt and Tommy. What a time to be alive, isn't it, Tommy? We're here in Austin celebrating... Dun, 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 dun. You're supposed to sing with me, Tommy. That's crazy. Oh, uh, sorry. That's fine. Don't worry about it. But hey, I'm very happy. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, it was... Uh... Another exciting race, Cota delivered in terms of track action again. And uh, wow, yeah, who does, uh, neither of us predicted in our predictions that Charles Leclerc uh, would win, particularly when he was fourth on the grid. But oh my God, the, the dream uh, start for him. And yeah, what, what a race as well. And we will reflect on all of that gloriousness. Um, and we've obviously you went to the track as well. You're going to touch a little bit upon that mm. uh, later on. Uh, but first and foremost, Tommy, why don't you begin with your most memorable moment? Well, my most memorable moment, of course, has to be Max Verstappen versus Lando Norris. We haven't really seen a battle between Max and Lando since Austria. And I thought I was watching the same thing, watching Lando spend lap after lap not overtaking despite having a massive advantage um, and then not being able to get past. It was quite frustrating to watch. Um, as a Max fan. I, even as a Max <laughs> fan, because I was like, how are you not passing him? You know, there was also the other moment at the start, which we'll touch on, on later, um, which I'm pretty sure I predicted in our qualifying wrap-up that Max would dive down the inside and run him wide, um, which is exactly what happened. So, again, surprised that uh, they didn't see that one coming. And then I think, yeah, the worst, the worst bit was the fact that Lando just couldn't get past. And then when he did, it wasn't even legal. Or was it? Because basically there's a lot of... Opinions, of course, on whether it was or not, but the stewards deemed it was illegal. And what do you, as a human, as a human, deem it? it is one thousand percent illegal. Um, you literally can't drive off the track to overtake someone. You never have been able to. It's something that Max Verstappen, before everyone goes, oh, you could, would say that as a Verstappen fanboy. It's something that I said in Austria. Fantastic impression. Yeah, that I hated that Max did himself this whole, oh, I'm ahead at the apex, and then you just accelerate onto the, which is exactly what Max did in Austria, right? And I, I called that out because I think it's like, it's blatant cheating, basically, that you just go round the outside onto the runoff. And what I can't understand is all these people going, what a ridiculous penalty. A thousand, like, every, I watched it and I was like, that's a penalty. I, am I watching a different sport? Like, why weren't they telling him that's going to be a penalty? You, you knew it was going to be a penalty. It's always a penalty. I've watched it for years, Formula One for years. That is always a penalty. So I don't understand why, one, he didn't give it back. I was, I was very surprised when he put in a defense on Max because I thought he was actually going to let him through at the very next corner. Um, and I, don't, I really don't understand the argument uh, that it wasn't a penalty. Like, it just flat out was. Oh, energetic <laughs> Tommy today. We've had cheating. We've had all kinds of words being thrown around. Uh, for, 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 don't say cheating. I know, yeah. you, do, you know what I mean. Yeah, In terms yeah, of yeah. like, it, it's bending the rules to basically be like, I'm ahead of the apex and then you just accelerate and drive off. And loads of drivers do it. And I think it's one of the worst parts of wheel to wheel racing that is a trend that they somehow need to clamp out. But unfortunately, that's just the nature of track limits now. Absolutely. Um, Max versus Lando, it was great to watch don't yeah. get me wrong oh, yeah. uh, i think that obviously on one side frustrating in the sense of that lando couldn't find a way through but it was brilliant max defended beautifully in my opinion there was the, the only time where i was like oh that's a bit that's a bit touch and go was the well actually no was lap one turn one which i think was once again max being max if you give him the inside line he's going to push the rules to the absolute limit he knows he's not going to get a penalty for that because it's lap one turn one if it's any other corner on any other lap and he's probably in trouble, but there's leniency there with the stewards. Um, so he uses that to his advantage. But then, yeah, the one again as well was that particular moment that we're all speaking about down into turn 12. Uh, and, and I think when I was first watching it, I've gone, oh, has, has Max actually given Lando enough space here? But I think the problem and where the stewards on further review now and watching the video back several times before recording this, is that Lando accelerates off the corner to make the position. That so, so, so on one side, you've got, does Max force another competitor off the track? You could argue in some ways he does because his, his late breaking move and he, I mean, he himself goes off the track 
So I think there is an argument from that side, and I do understand why Formula One fans are questioning that side of thing because neither car stayed on the track. But that is a separate, a separate thing to deliberate. Lando going off the track and accelerating off to make the move is why he got the penalty. Had he just kind of rejoined normally, maybe there was more of an argument to, you know, say if he came out side by side with Max, they're both off the track, but he's not showing as much of a dumping of the throttle to make the move, then perhaps he would have gotten away with it. Uh, obviously, it's heat of the moment as well in terms of what McLaren decide to do in that situation. They just doubled down and were like, nope, we're all good. Yeah, One... let's, let's maybe go to that question because that is exactly Okay, what sorry, yeah, up. so there is a question. P1 Patreon member Sam, why didn't McLaren just tell Lando to give the position back? Surely it wasn't worth the risk. I think for this one, I'm not going to be too harsh on McLaren because there are a few factors that you have to take into account here. One, they weren't absolutely sure in the heat of the moment whether that was going to be given as a penalty. When you look at the other strange moments throughout the race, Perhaps they should have thought about maybe George Russell getting a penalty for like literally nothing, I felt like. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that where they weren't sure whether they were going to get a penalty. And also, they might have even felt like they could have dropped five seconds on Max and thought, I did think well, that, let's actually. just roll the dice. Lando's got fresher tyres, just drive away. And I think he was 4.1 in the end ahead of Max. So it was close. In hindsight, the beauty of hindsight, we go, yeah, he should have given the position back straight away. But it's not as easy as that. So I'm not going to be too harsh on McLaren. No, I think they should have. I think they should have given the place back, obviously. And I said at the start that I think it was a slam dunk penalty all day long. So watching it, you've surely got to give the position back. Um, and we see it all the time that, that drivers do that. So I was very surprised. But the thinking behind them basically trying to extend that gap, because Lando did appear to have such an advantage um despite not being able to pass him you know he was so much quicker you could tell um and i did think as soon as he overtook him off the track it is a it's a, a questionable kind of um thing in formula one that we've said so many times that you can kind of do an illegal move and then go see you later i'm off down the road um because it works because um you know if you can pass someone and, and pull the gap then it's better than uh, not being able to pass him. So I almost think that maybe that's what they were trying to go for there, um, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen indeed. Uh, P1 Patreon member Snowborn said, so how did Verstappen not get a penalty for forcing Norris off the track? Do the rules not apply to him? I'm not sure whether this is uh, alluding to turn There's one, two lap moments, one, isn't there? Maybe or we go for, for both. turn 12, but I've kind of touched upon why I think he didn't get a penalty in turn one, lap one. It's because he knows there's a bit more leniency there with it being lap one. And then with the turn 12 incident, that, I mean, that in itself, I, I don't know if that part went under the radar slightly because obviously the other part of it of Lando accelerating off was what was investigated. Does Max also require some kind of note or investigation in the sense that he didn't leave enough room for Lando? Yes, I think the nature of Cota, we've seen this a lot. Um, we saw it in the sprint um, yesterday as well with the, the Ferraris and then passing Russell. And there's so many corners at that track where maybe other tracks you can leave a car's width on the outside. Some, sometimes the nature of the corners are so tight and the apex is so tightened that you do have to almost like push them off, which is a bit annoying. Um, and I can, do, would not want to be a steward doing um, the US Grand Prix because it is a track where it, it, the cars do like push each other wide so much. Um, I personally think that the... Um, the George Russell one was an absolute joke. Like that shouldn't have been a, a penalty at all. He was on the track, so I don't understand why. We saw that move so many times in the sprint. Um, I do not understand for a second why that was a penalty. So just, just to kind of cover that one. But the move at turn one, I just think that's, again, like it was always going to happen. Um, and I know Lando did go quite aggressive and cover the gap, but you can't give Max a car's width because he will go down the inside. Um, it, but to be fair to Lando, it's such a wide turn that it is really hard to kind of cover the inside. I feel like, you know, just going from memory here, but I feel like there's been so many times at Cota where the person in second has just dived down the inside because you can kind of push it off. I think the, the famous example is obviously Hamilton and Rosberg where they, you know, threw a cap at him afterwards. And, um, and you yeah, know, that was a legal move. 
went up the inside, there was no penalty. And I don't think the max one was either. Like you drive down the inside um, and well, it worked well for Charles, didn't it? <laughs> it did, it did. Thanks Max for your aggressive nature in, in overtaking. Uh, next question from P1 Patreon member Lumixion. Does Norris need to be a bit more aggressive in his moves? Yes, he needs to be aggressive in his moves and his defending. And I, I, I questioned this, didn't I, when we spoke about this before, about yeah. whether Lando will treat Max slightly differently or not defend as hard as maybe we saw against the Ferraris in the sprint or that sort of thing. And I will give him an element of forgiveness in the sense of, you've pointed out very rightly, turn one is so wide that there are so many different lines that you can take. So I, I do understand why Lando has kind of fainted to the inside, but not want to pinch right on the apex, really on the inside, because that is a pretty difficult um, corner to then get off of because of the way it's uh, the way it's shaped. But at the same time, I'm going, in my head, I'm thinking the only way he doesn't come out first is by not covering the inside line. Because I don't think you see many, and this is going purely off memory, moves of someone going round the outside of someone on turn one, lap one. I think if you always cover the inside, you're all good. Yeah. But Lando did keep that door open. And whether it's, because obviously, you know, a lot of drivers will faint to somewhere and then move back once they've sort of put off the driver behind to not go up the inside. He's not done that enough in order for Max to go, oh, he's not, he's, he's still going to leave a car's width here. So Max has gone, okay, I'm still going to go. And then, of course, Max is going to do that. That was my first thing was like, of course he's going to go up the inside. We predicted it yesterday, even. And it's not even like he was side by side. Lando got a great start. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't have a bad start He at could all. have easily just... Obviously, yeah. I'm spoke, speaking like a true uh, sofa watcher. But yeah. at the same time, that, I think, was the most frustrating thing from a Lando versus Max point of view. But thank you also, Lando, for doing it because Charles <laughs> went through from fourth to first after turn one. I actually would give him Lando more the benefit of the doubt for for turn one I don't think it was um a really bad start um he yeah he definitely should have defended the inside I actually think the the battle at the end is where Lando's done sort of worse for his kind of the mental game in the battle between him and Max Verstappen because we said yesterday that we've not actually seen Max and Lando fight each other other than Austria and Max got a massive one up on Lando there from a mentality point of view. The fact that Lando was so much quicker and should have passed him. This was Lando's chance to turn that whole narrative around because it's the only time we've really seen them properly go wheel to wheel. And Lando had such an advantage that, that you know, the, the championship is still on in my opinion. And McLaren's obviously got a very good car. The Red Bull didn't run away today with it. That there's a, every chance that there's still you know, still a big ass. What about Ferrari? And Ferrari, we'll get on to <laughs> Ferrari. But I think Lando just making a move on Max and even, you know, even the movie went around the outside, like I say, that he was always and went off. He had five more laps to do the move if he had just let him back through. And he had such an advantage, he should have been able to pass him in, in those 10 laps. And if he had, that is such a huge mentality moment in the championship. That, Mac, that Lando can be like, I've gone wheel to wheel with Max and I've beaten him and I've overtaken him. But again, he's come out with, a, with that not being the case. So, and, and Max is going to be Max. He's going to drive to the, the limit. And I, and I do think that's not a good chance for Lando because that was a huge opportunity for him to really like get one over on Max. Yeah, and going back to the frustration of watching it as much as I was loving it, that the thing for me was the amount of times Lando would do the same thing yeah. and think it's going to be better. And this, as soon as he commits to the outside line, you are essentially a passenger in terms of this battle because Verstappen can dictate the line. Yeah. Whereas if you're Max, if, if that is the other way around, Max is steaming down the inside line late on the brakes and attempting to slow the car down. We didn't see that once from Lando. Lando didn't try to go up the inside at turn 12 I can't believe once. It. Yeah, I can't believe and, it. And whether he's afraid because of the marbles or whatever it might be, he was just trying to be far too clean with it and putting the same method in. He was four tenths behind at one point. I remember looking at the gap intensely before they came around turn 11 and down the massive straight. And he was four tenths behind 
and then had DRS and still didn't manage to get through on him. It's, I don't, you don't see that in anywhere else. Yeah, is it, is it too harsh to say that if it was Lando and Max Verstappen was any other driver in that situation with the tyre advantage, how much he gained on him, and, and I even thought it, even though it was Max and Lando, and I knew how aggressive Max can be in defending, that 10 laps to go, I was like, Max has absolutely no chance. Like, yeah. There's no way Max should have finished that race ahead of Lando. We're, we're, we're all looking to see if Lando can catch Carlos. Yeah. That, that's yeah, where yeah, the kind of battle... Absolutely no way Lando should not have got past him. Yeah, don't situation. get me wrong. Max did a brilliant job as well and made it as hard think, as yeah. possible for Lando. I think that you know, once we saw the, the position change and Lando was defending into turn one, he was a lot, it was noticeably more erratic from Lando into turn one defending, whereas Max did exactly the same thing every single lap. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's robotic. Yeah. Uh, it really is. So props to Max as well for making his, uh, Lando's life as hard as possible. And this is why he's a three, soon to be probably four time F1 world champion. So um, big shout out to Max. Uh, I think he drove fantastically well, despite the car being completely and utterly washed which uh, that in itself was is surprise, ridiculous actually, i really thought we, we thought it was going to be we both predicted max first in, in yeah. the race and thought he'd clear off particularly after you know making the move on Lando. but my goodness me the ferraris were quick they were i did actually predict him second and third um uh, but I, I clearly wasn't deluded enough you said yeah you said yesterday that you do wonder how much ferrari could yeah. be in there if they weren't fighting each other because we did see that unbelievable pace and how close Carlos got to Max the day before. Um, and yeah, it, it did work perfectly for him because they got through. It did. And so let's go to my most memorable moment, which is, of course, Zhou Guan Yu's spin. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I even was going to interrupt you and say, is it Zhou? <laughs> it's, of course, Charles Leclerc winning in Austin. <sighs> Come on. I mean, obviously, the, the parting of the Red Sea happened in turn one. And he went straight through when Lando and, and uh, Max had their little whoopsie. And it was beautiful at that point. And then I start to question, right, okay, how, how good can this get? And it was just easy. It was it a really easy victory. It was yeah. easy for Charles. He drove away in that first stint. Um, the mediums were working really well for him. He went the longest out of the front runners. Then Pitt and whether he was just sort of managing the gap to Carlos or whatever. Carlos was, had, a, had a great last in, it has to be said, and, and got the gap to sort of five seconds at one point. And I was like, relax, let's calm this down. <laughs> we don't need these two battling wheel to for the victory. Uh, but, but Charles was, was, was amazing. And I think it just showed, and I had said that in the podcast, that Ferrari looked like they had really good race pace. It, they just needed to be in the mix. And then, ta-da, we're, we're, we're leading the race. And, and Carlos in third, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, what alternate reality are we in where Charles didn't have the qualifying pace, but the Ferrari race pace was was the one? Um, and yeah, it shows that you know when he's got the car to deliver, he does it. And yeah, it was a fantastic drive. Um, Carlos been able to make his way through in second as well. Um, ooh, it's going to be it's going to be exciting end of the season because Ferrari always love to bang the odd upgrades on at the end and turn the wick up for the for the finale. Well, they had no upgrades into this weekend. They had literally brought nothing. Yeah. They and they just... won the race with some really good race pace. So that, I know everyone's gonna be thinking this next question. <laughs> Abu Dhabi 2021 Survivor P1 Patreon member asks, can Leclerc still win the World Drivers' Championship if we get some good script writing? Yes. <laughs> it would take Absolutely. very good script writing. A lot, it would take miraculous script writing. If I am not mistaken, the, uh, the gap is 79 points, I believe. Uh, four podiums in the last five races for Charles. That is, I mean, that's just goat behavior, isn't it really? Um, but I'm just gonna have a look very quickly if it loads. Here we go. So my math, 25 plus, he's 79 points. That's a lot. That's a lot of points, yeah. but I still believe. Uh, <laughs> little Max and Lando, whoopsie in the next one in Mexico, 54 points, then it's, Nine, yeah, no, 20, not 29, 29, and then four, and then he wins. To be fair, what a you know, we're, we're joking about that, that, that situation. The, the fact that Max, obviously, you know, going back to Max and Lando defending each other, they couldn't really afford to crash because it would have been a 25 point swing for Charles, and that would have put him, you know, I think on the back of Lando, which is which is actually. 
you know, I, I did wonder how much you were thinking about that the whole time when they were racing. It's like, these two go out. Charles is probably going to be on what, like very nearly the same points as Lando or right up, right back up behind him. Yeah, I was yeah. dreaming. I was dreaming. Um, but I think, unfortunately for Charles, he kind of needs that to happen maybe like, well, he does. He needs it to happen three times and then he's still not there. You know, if he wins three of the last five races and they don't score any points, then he's still not quite there. And then you go into the final two races. So it's a huge, huge ask, but it's a great end of the season. I just... And, and I'm, I'm speaking as someone that loves a title fight and I'm, you know, I can't imagine what it's like as a Ferrari fan. We just need Ferrari to carry that momentum through the season, not have this like mid-season dip where they kind of fall off again and then they get back to Monza and they're amazing and then go on this great run to the end. Because it really is a question of like what might have been in those few races where Charles was getting lapped and, you know, they're having an absolute shocker. He could. He genuinely could have been right in there if he was yeah. the if he was the one maximising the Please points. Stop. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> he making could have. He could have. Making me what if. Uh, so I've done the mental maths, and Charles has to gain on average sixteen points a weekend on Max Verstappen in order to win. Okay. Uh, that includes obviously the sprints as well. So uh, look, I'm saying. It's a big ask. I'm on. I'm on for it. Let's go. Uh, but <laughs> I'm on. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but yes, uh, I don't think he's going to win, sadly, uh, the World Championship. But Ferrari, I mean, how times can change from Singapore, which is obviously a very different track, very different climate to Dakota. But the pecking order just goes, let's shake the box. And there we go. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how, again, we're, we're here going into the race weekend thinking, oh, well, this is... You know, McLaren again, they've got the, the best car. Surely it's going to be McLaren's win. And you've had Red Bull winning the sprint race, Ferrari winning the, the main race. One, two. Um, yeah, it's quite insane. So what, so that's Charles' third win of the season, mm -hmm. which, yeah, is the same number as Lando, um, which is quite also quite an insane th thing to think about, yeah. that they've got the same number of uh, wins. So, yeah, Ferrari winning... Um, a good amount of races, and again, it's just flipping every single race. We go to Mexico, Mercedes um, will probably again. be fastest yeah. ahead of Alpine, and then we'll be like, "What's going on?" Yeah. Uh, next question <laughs> from P1 Patreon member Mal Dibs: How has this Ferrari pace gone unnoticed, and where did it come from? McLaren were miles ahead at Singapore, so was the four-week break worthwhile? Well, I mean, the four-week break where Ferrari went, we have nothing. We are bringing nothing to the weekend, but sometimes that in itself can be a better way of going. And I think that obviously a lot of Formula One fans, including myself, when you see a whole host of upgrades come to a Grand Prix weekend, you go, they're going to be faster. But sometimes dialing in a package from a previous upgrade that they brought in a few races before can work just as, much, uh, just as well when they're learning how things work. Of course, there's no F1 testing in season. So they are very much learning on the racetrack. And, and it seems as though this might have been the case for Ferrari goes back to yesterday where we said that the pace is so close now that you just have a little bit of performance by a couple of tenths or whatever. You elevate yourselves from being maybe challenging for fourth or fifth to even winning the race. That's, you know, what we said with Mercedes yesterday and how their form like flip-flops. Sometimes it doesn't even need to be upgrades. You know, when McLaren, when Formula One posted that update, upgrades graphic and you saw seven, it was seven for McLaren, I think mm. it was, at the top of the list, you went, well, look, give them the championship now. Yeah. But they've, they've finished uh, fourth and fifth. So what, probably their worst result in a while. In a, in they a had while. a podium streak, didn't they, for yeah, a very so, long time. Yeah, so yeah, they've lost their podium streak, which no one would have said at the start of the year. My mum has just texted me during this. <laughs> Glad Charles won. That cheered you up. We'd love to see it. <laughs> um, love next question from D Spicy Lemon Pie. <laughs> I've just realised that as a username. Did Lewis really make a mistake or was he just calling it off? <laughs> that is such a great question. Ah, he's just going to just bin it in the same corner as where Russell binned it. It's going to be believable. Of course he didn't uh, call it off. <laughs> the Hamilton, worst crash gate ever. Yeah, Hamilton had a fantastic start. He was up to 12th yeah. when he made that, that error. So you do wonder, I think it was very, well, of course, Russell started at the back as well. But I think both of them uh, had a great chance to, to score at least some points, despite having yeah. the, the worst uh, beginning in terms of where they started uh, a race. But Hamilton was not calling it off. I don't think he got bored or anything like that. It was just a mistake. That Mercedes, on a knife's edge, as always and Hamilton having one of the worst weekends I can remember 
uh, for him personally. I'd love an alternate reality where you could could put two either bad or mid drivers in a Mercedes to see just how bad that car really is because it changes so much and you do wonder how much of this car is that they've got two fantastic drivers to sometimes deliver a really great result but it is still a bit of a an S box um, because you know they their form like no other team is just all all over the place like it feels an absolute age ago that they were winning three races in a row yeah and we were even talking about Hamilton oh, I reckon Hamilton's going to win a lot more races throughout the season I would not predict that now didn't you predict Hamilton to finish second in the championship I as think well? at one point yeah maybe no, that was I our did, mid-season predictions I'm was it sure. the mid-season or I think it, no I think it was most wins after the summer ah. after the summer break I thought Hamilton would get the most wins because yeah they'd they'd won three on the bounce um and I'd be amazed if they even won one now yeah, then you predicted the biggest good surprise, and then that's yeah, what that that's hit what straight away. That I was, was I was actually crazy. sat at that turn uh, as he spun backwards into the wall, and I was oh, like, "There's biggest good surprise!" God. Didn't you? I saw him once going backwards. That is ridiculous. Uh, next question: P1 Patreon member Alan Enderpay. Should Lawson go into the Red Bull seat now for the rest of the season? Imagine that upgraded to V Car for one race, then stick him in the Red Bull before the Mexican Grand Prix. Like, sorry, Perez. We know. I know. We said we we're going to keep you in there for your home <laughs> Imagine race. Imagine Mexico. See, I mean, that would honestly yeah. uh, create some serious uh, storm. Yeah. But Lawson, brilliant. I, I, I love that he is not afraid to, one, pee off Fernando Alonso. I mean, my goodness me. I watched the full clip from the sprint. Lawson was being naughty, don't get me wrong. Yes, because we, uh, just to cover that, we missed, didn't we, that there was a, a bit of extra Well, F1 naughtiness. posted just a small clip when there was actually a full lap and a bit battle, so... And and previous even on lap one and lap five. Yeah. But they didn't show. So lots of lots of action. Uh, but but Lawson was, was brilliant. He started from the back and ended up finishing ninth. He had Sonoda over the radio losing his mind over the fact that Lawson had come out on fresh mediums ahead of him. And he's like, no, how has this happened? Yeah. Uh, so you can tell that Sonoda's probably feeling the pressure a little bit as well uh, from that. But it, brilliant. He made so many overtakes and was not afraid to get his elbows out when he needed to. Lawson, I, I mean, it's, it's literally it's the best statement. race he could have had after this whole break bef- since he's last uh, been in the Formula One car. Yeah, absolutely. He was obviously on the back foot and we were thinking, oh, well, he's, he's in a car that can't really score points. And he's going to be starting last. So it's going to be a shame for him that he's not be, going to be able to show what he can do. That is not the case. My word. Insane. Indeed. Uh, how far did he actually finish away from? So he finished eight seconds behind Hulkenberg, which you'd have to say. Wow. He only finished 11 seconds off Perez. like that. If Lawson had beaten Perez, then maybe they would have just switched him for the next I mean, race. <laughs> literally, though, if he hadn't started at the back, he's beaten Perez, sure. Yeah, yeah, race yeah, or at least definitely. with him, yeah, yeah, uh, with that 11-second uh, loss that he would have had just coming through the field. But yeah, big shout-out to Lawson. Well done to him. Uh, at Sylvie Pope Photo comes in with a question. Do you think there's any chance Williams could release signs to Red Bull and keep Colapinto. No. No. That is this is we're in we're in dreamland right now. We're we're playing the Sims. Like this is this is fantasy stuff, I think. Uh, as much as we all want signs to to be in a, a better team, I think what we are starting to realise is that the Williams is not actually that bad of a car. And I, I truly believe signs could cook next year in that Williams and be finishing P5, P6, P7 potentially if they if they keep building this car uh, to what what it clearly has as a foundation. So no, I don't think this is going to have a, a crazy little swap. But Colapinto... Oh, my word. I, again, I, he scores a point. It's just... Now these down in 16th. These rookies, unreal. Yeah, Colapinto is having an unbelievable um, season. The fact that, yeah, he, he was obviously did a, a great job in, the, in sprint qualifying, uh, but didn't deliver any points there. But the fact that he managed to get a point after we were talking about Williams yesterday, they're both going out in Q3... Uh, Albon obviously had a big moment. Uh, I don't know if that even got picked up, but it was by where I was watching. So um, I don't know if it was on the screen, but we'll talk about that later. Which um, one? Uh, Albon at the f- uh, turn 19 went off. Um, During the race? Yeah, yeah, and dropped loads of places at the start. Um, so yeah, the there was um, there was that. So Albon, again, Albon not having a good race and Colapinto absolutely flying. Um to go back to the question yesterday of 
would they put Colophon in the car instead of Albon? If this happens in the next five races, uh, maybe. I don't. I don't know if they. It, it would have to be an extreme, extremely bad loss of form for Albon. I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But but if Albon doesn't start the next year well and science does absolutely demolish him, they could. They genuinely problem, yeah. could. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy, but. Yeah, not not a good race for Albon and Colapinto again. Absolutely superb, going really long uh, on the tires like these rookies. I mean, we've sort of. I think maybe you know I will admit maybe been a little bit unfair to Formula Two and the potential of Formula Two drivers, but maybe it is just a case that it is so competitive that we don't have that standout um, person, and maybe it is time that there's a lot of maybe mid drivers in, in Formula One that are taking up and hogging seats and it's nice to see some fresh talent coming oh, in. Name them. And uh, <laughs> well, I'll save them for the, the live show controversial opinions. <laughs> um, but yeah, you look at that there and see Lawson and Colapinto who've basically just jumped into a Formula One car in the last few races. And uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Absolutely unreal. So big GGs to those guys. Uh, let's move to biggest winner, driver or team, Ferrari. It has to be. One, two, no upgrades brought. Thank you very much. Biggest winner. Yeah, it's got to be easy. The easiest, biggest winner of the lot, really. Um, no one else is a, is a big winner, really, I wouldn't say, other than mm. obviously the, the Lawson and Colapinto and, and stuff. But the fact that the, the team, as a whole team, they manage maximum points is a huge W. Apart from the fastest lap that Ocon stole away. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Yeah. I won't go off on that, but I'm thank God to get rid of that. <laughs> I know you don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree, uh, but that's fine. We can. Um, I, I agree with the sentiment of random drivers it pitting doesn't, it's in not the earned. 17th. Yeah, it's not but earned. top 10, best fastest lap, thank you very much. That is a point that uh, I think should be given, but that is a <laughs> conversation for another day. Uh, okay, let's go to biggest loser. I am going to submit Lando Norris. Uh, as biggest loser, not Savage. purely because of the fact that he lost out to Max Verstappen, but just that mentality that we've spoken about here. We're talking about the championship. This is what the, all of the drivers are going for. And this was an opportunity for Lando to beat Max Verstappen. And as much as I don't think it would really affect Max if Lando had won, I think from a Lando confidence perspective, it would have done him wonders. So I am going to say that one just purely because of how frustrating it was to watch him not get through. Yeah, it's a big, it's, you know, it sounds crazy that he's finished the race fourth, but it was a massive, it's a massive title blow really for him. Um, even though it sounds ridiculous to say it's only a couple of points lost. It's the, it's the mental like gains that he would have had there. Um, obviously got to put Hamilton into the mix. Um, just, not, just the worst weekend. Just the worst weekend he possibly could have imagined. No idea why that happened. <laughs> uh, we'll get into that that later. So, yeah, um, I, I think yeah, and and maybe even uh, Alex Albon as well. Just starting to sweat a little bit, seeing that that, that narrative of Colapinto just coming in and being amazing just continue. Indeed, uh, there's also another biggest loser that you wanted to talk about. Uh, biggest loser. I think was maybe um, for me. I, so, so I went to the track um, today, and uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll you maybe have seen a few of my tweets that basically uh, me and my wife have. Uh, she's come over to and um, Austin, and this is a basically a race that we've always wanted to do. It's been like our number one bucket list race, and Austin itself has been one of the best, coolest cities I've ever been to. Everything away from the track has been unbelievable. And the track is awesome as well itself. Like the views are good. I was really surprised at how good the, the GA was actually as well. And the views you can get from GA to see some great spots. But the fan experience of not having commentary is one of the most insane experiences I've ever experienced at a racetrack. And I think it's so unfair that, you know, my general admission ticket for two general admission tickets cost me, I think like six or $700. And I had no idea what was going on in the race. And I think the bare minimum for Formula One fans that have paid that money to go to a race is knowing what's going on. If they wanna, if they wanna put in this fancy package where you can get 
you know, a screen or whatever and charge people some money, fine. But the bare minimum should be trackside commentary. It's one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had. I think, I think the weirdest experience actually, because one thing in particular was we were really excited for the anthem because we've been to the Indy 500, you know, Americans go ham on the anthem. It's an amazing moment. Silence, absolute silence. They didn't play it through the, so, so everyone stood up. It was like being at a headphone disco. Everyone stood up and you could watch on the screen and you had subtitles on the screen. So it was, so you, it was basically like watching the TV on mute, American anthem. People stood up, couldn't hear it. And then everyone sat down and then they played the, the AF1 intro, no sound. And then there's no track commentary. And the only uh, way you can get track commentary was these little radios, um, but they basically, they, they gave away and stuff, but you, they sold out, like you couldn't get any of them. It's worth pointing out that this is the particular section that you were at, because I know that there is track commentary at some areas, yeah, so, yeah. rather than saying that it's a, a, yeah, a, a yeah, full yeah. circuit problem. Yeah. Um, but perhaps that is just from a... Uh, it's so, it's so it's strange being, yeah, it was so strange, because like you're so used to it, like Silverstone and other tracks, it was, it was such a bizarre thing to like, go around and not be able to hear the commentary because normally they're like like they've got it like big volume well, it has and, to be doesn't and it, it has formula to be one because it's formula one cars yeah. um but very weird um and i almost because they didn't have radios i went up to the formula one stand uh, and they had uh, a radio like the official formula one radio you could purchase uh do you want to guess how much that would have been to buy a like the the big chunky oh, the headphones that yeah it's not rent, is it? You buy them. So like yeah, so I, them. yeah, yeah. $80 or something. $160. And I was like, I was willing, like it would have been annoying, but I was willing to pay, you know, like, I was like, oh, I, I do want to hear it. So like, you know, if I have to pay $30, $40 for a, for a headset, then fine. But $160 is for something absolutely you're use once. outrageous. Yeah. And I just, I just, as a Formula One fan, I don't like seeing other Formula One fans. Like, the Formula One fans that are there deserve the best experience they get. They pay a lot of money for their ticket. I know what it's like to, you know, basically, like, sacrifice a lot to be able to go to the track and go to races. Um, you pay so much money to go. Like, people will save up for, you know, like, years sometimes to be able to enjoy this experience. And it's, it's a shame that, that the fans don't get you know, what, what should be the bare minimum experience sometime. Yeah, I agree. I think that just generally Formula One is outgrowing the fan experience that, to, to which they are charging for. Yeah. Back in, you know, 10 years ago, you'd pay maybe 200, 300 quid for a full grandstand weekend ticket. And fair enough, I think that matches what you get. If you sit in a grandstand, you've got you've the had V12, commentary so you whatever. Have yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but now we're getting into a... Because of the demand, which is fair enough, I know how supply and demand works, but yeah. also... There's the problem here of like Formula One and the circuits and the deal that they have in the sense of obviously the tracks will buy the right to then host a Formula One race, then they make their money back through the ticket sales and everything else. So there's always going to be a, a bottom line of profit to be made from the circuits. But the circuits clearly aren't willing to invest in the fan experience because it's not worth it from their side either. Yeah. So it's it's kind of this conundrum where neither one party has to be like right we do need to improve the it's formula a really one fan unique experience. situation isn't it where you've got like the, the formula one the sport itself and then the circuits and it's like sometimes their responsibility because it's a very different experience at every circuit you go to and i will say kota was absolutely um awesome like i say the, the ga views and everything was really cool but that was that was so odd to me you know i had someone behind me that i was chatting to in the the grandstand that said they watched qualifying uh, and they basically left after um, Q1 and watched it in like an amphitheatre just so they could find out what was going on. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't well, hear it. That's the bare minimum. It needs to be. There, there has to be more. Like, for example, like the, and as you say, it does vary from circuit to circuit. But just even the screens, right? So like one of the things, I, I was genuinely using my phone to zoom <laughs> yeah, in on the screen to see what the gaps were. Because I couldn't see. It's like, surely that's the bare minimum is to have more screens that everywhere where no matter where you're looking on the circuit you know what's going on on track also actually just on that one of the funniest uh things which is like annoying but you just like have to laugh at how ridiculous it was is um i couldn't i couldn't see what was going on 
with the turn one move between Lando and Norris until I watched it back as a replay. Between Lando and Norris? Sorry, sorry Lando and Norris. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Nor Norris and Verstappen into turn one um, because, because there's no track comes and you know they have like uh, captions. Uh, the, the captions, captions were covering the, yeah. the cars, so I, I couldn't, I, so I couldn't see it. I saw that <laughs> so weird. Well. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we've popped off for far yeah. too long. Hopefully, that gives you an idea that, that if going to Formula One races is amazing. But we think that uh, yeah, I don't. I want to just hundred percent clarify. Like, I don't want you to feel sorry for me going to races. This is about. Oh, I don't like, feel sorry for you. Exactly. At all, this is. I just want to like make sure it comes across that like Formula One fans deserve better. And having like been there and you know experienced it, like the fans deserve the best experience they can get. And I think they can do a lot, a lot better from F1 and circuit side. Okay, good. All right, let's now move on to our predictions that we made. And I think this might be the worst, biggest, good surprise uh, predictions we've had in quite some time. I went for Alex Albon, which was very surprising just how bad he was in comparison to Colapinto. But sadly, there's good in front of that. So no point for me. Uh, and yeah, Lewis Hamilton. Uh, I've made a joke on Twitter that when Russell had his penalty that I could lock in biggest good surprise because that meant Hamilton out qualified him. Um, but then he decided to spin backwards in uh, turn 19. Yeah. Okay. Biggest flop. Uh, I went for Sauber and uh, they were doing oh, great. They were so doing close. great. And then Ocon just decided to get beaten because he pitted to take faster slap. For no reason. I could have argued that because they finished last in every single session. Then Ocon just decided to enter the chat. Which, yeah. which, you know, I'm still feeling slightly hard done by here, but... What was hilarious as well was listening to two um, new Formula One fans uh, behind me that just fell in love with how rubbish the two Salbers were and were, like, cheering every lap they came past. So you're telling me there is a point there, then, because they were terrible. <laughs> it, was, it was actually, like, watching, um, yeah, like, F2, but... Well, you just, said it, you just said it for me. No, no because... Ocon pit, no, Ocon, Ocon pit, Ocon, and he had, no, he was no, having a terrible race. Ocon ruined it. No, 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 wait, what? I never said that they had to finish... I did say off the back. Okay, fine, <laughs> whatever. And I went for Nico Hulkenberg, who had a great race. So we've absolutely... Our biggest flop was basically our predictions this week. Yeah, that was horrendous. Okay, sprint pole. I went for Lando Norris. Incorrect. I went for Max Verstappen, which was correct. Well done. Do you want to write a little one next I'll to that? I'll write so a little one. In. There we go. Uh, sprint winner, I went for Lando Norris. Nope. Uh, I also went for Lando Norris, which was a nope. So going Lando Norris for everything was uh, not great particularly chance. great. <laughs> However, pole position, I went for Lando Norris, which was correct. Indeed, and so did I. I went for Lando Norris oh, pole why position. Why did you go for Lando pole, for God's sake? Ah, and then I didn't even talk about Ferrari in, in our top three, which is um, really sad. Uh, but I went for Piastri P3. I went for Hamilton P3. Um, <laughs> that was good. so bad. Uh, Verstappen P2. No. I went for Norris P2. No. And then I went for Norris P1. No. I went for Verstappen I'm P1. I'm never no. predicting Lando to win ever again. That's it. It's yeah. done. Until next week. See you there. But we now move on to our one... I was so bad this week. Yeah, you... One crazy prediction. I went for Colapinto does not beat Albon in either quality or race sessions. And I'm pretty sure he beat them in almost everything apart from qualifying. Good times. Uh, and I absolutely chefed. Colapinto in the points, but not Albon. Yeah, Unbelievable. You, yeah, That's one of my best predictions ever, actually. All right. I just, just want just to... Bit... I've got to gloat about something. Shall yeah, one brilliant trumpet so. live on the podcast. Crazy. Uh, Blowing your own pipe as you want. Yeah, no, I've got it right this time. <laughs> And then finally, three crazy predictions from you, wonderful lot. Uh, firstly, P1 Patreon member Justin, F194. Max and Lando both finish outside the points. That could have happened. I though. actually thought about this prediction happen, when yeah. they were racing. I was like, oh, actually, remember that prediction that someone said? And we were like, no, they'd have had to crash. And then there we are. Uh, P1 Patreon member Kian LR. Two or more Formula A DNFs. Nope, we just had Hamilton. And then P1 Patreon member Longo1996. Lawson finishes in the points. Hell that is shout. correct. Huge. And that prediction. would have been made when he had already known that he was getting a penalty as well. So that is, that is an massive. unbelievable prediction. That is massive from Longo. Well done. And uh, that is it. I hope you've enjoyed this little Austin live podcast. If you have, let us know in the comments. Leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. We've hit half a million, which I don't think we've actually said uh, on YouTube that we've mm. hit half a million subscribers. So thank you so much to each and every one of you for subscribing. Uh, Tommy, final thoughts? Final thoughts. Um, I love F1, despite right. the uh, ranting about the, the circuit and the experience sometimes. Like, it's, just, it's just the best sport in the world. And it was so good. Um, it's in such a good place. We say it all the time, but 
uh, we've had another different winner. No one seems to be able to string wins together at the moment. Um, please don't change the rules. <laughs> oh, but they will be. Uh, my final thoughts are that we've got our final show in three hours and 35 minutes from now in Austin downtown and uh, cannot wait for it. It's going to be awesome. The, the US live show tour has been absolutely unbelievable. Uh, we're doing our December ones, remember, as well. If you're in the UK uh, in the middle of December to reflect on this epic season. Uh, so, yeah, go and check that out if you haven't already. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Keep pushing in the gym, keep sending faxes. <laughs> sending faxes.